Hello, I'm Mark Crutcher, President of Life Dynamics Incorporated in Denton, Texas, and I want to welcome you to the first edition of Life Talk from May 1999. We've got a jam-packed hour ahead, but before we get started, I'm going to introduce you to my assistant for the last four years, and now the co-host of Life Talk, Zentra Tuttle. Zentra, why don't you take just a few seconds and tell the nice folks what they can expect to see on today's program. Sure, Mark, I'd be glad to. In a moment, you're going to see a chilling interview that I conducted with Kelly, one of our spies who works inside an abortion mill harvesting baby parts for the very lucrative fetal tissue market. Then we're going to be joined on the set by Eric Hara, who until recently worked in several of America's death camps. Now he has repented and become a frontline warrior in the battle for the right to life. Mark, he's also going to share with us some of his own perspectives on what Kelly reveals in her interview. Yeah, he does have some unique ideas about sure, that. Sure, he's been there. He yeah, knows what's right. going on. He's been inside. Um, but also, he's a really neat guy. He really is. You know, people really take to Eric. He's got a great personality. We've had a great visit with him right. and gotten a lot of information right. from him, but we've become good friends with him also. Right, and it's been the last four days here with him have, have been really great. And, of course, as you know, my daughter Sheila just instantly took to him. And, she really did. She's know. been following him all around like a little puppy dog. It's been really cute to watch. Yeah, this. he's had to have a lot of patience with Sheila because, like all eight-year-olds, she can be very, uh, what's the right word, uh, persistent. Would that be kind? Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah, that's one way to put it. <laughs> yeah, we, and he has been very, very patient mm -hmm. with her. Well, later in the program, we'll be telling you how you can subscribe to Life Talk. We'll also be discussing a few of the things you'll be seeing in upcoming editions. But first, let's go to Alan Ackles with Life Talk News. Alan? All right, Mark, thank you. In March, the godfather of legalized abortion in America, Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman, died. The author of the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision, Blackman was an unabashed defender of that ruling. His retirement in 1994 allowed longtime friend Bill Clinton to appoint a successor who would continue the court's pro-abortion majority. On April 14th, a Michigan judge sentenced Dr. Jack Evorkian to 10 to 25 years in prison following his conviction for second-degree murder. This comes after five previous trials resulted in acquittals for the former pathologist. Kevorkian, who admits to having participated in at least 130 assisted suicides, will have to serve at least six years before being eligible for parole. Since his incarceration, he has backed away from his consistent threat to starve himself to death if sent to prison. A new study released by the Center for Gender Equality found that 53% of American women now believe that abortion should either be outlawed altogether or restricted to cases of rape, incest, or to save the woman's life. The organization's leader, former Planned Parenthood President Faye Waddleton, called the results very disturbing. In related news, a nationwide survey of college freshmen conducted by UCLA found that support for legalized abortion dropped 14 points between 1990 and 1998. And a poll released in the March issue of RN Magazine found that 61% of registered nurses now say they would not work in a unit where abortions are performed. On January 26th, Texas abortionist John Alderman was sent to federal prison and ordered to pay $125,000 in restitution for income tax evasion and Medicaid fraud. Alderman's legal troubles have also resulted in the closing of his Odessa abortion clinic. Wisconsin abortionist Neville Duncan was sentenced to 30 days in jail and 18 months probation after being convicted for beating up his wife and possession of crack cocaine. Duncan was already serving 90 days in jail for failure to pay child support from a prior marriage. In 1998, his current wife Brenda made headlines when she was fined $200 for mooning and threatening a group of pro-life picketers. On January 29th, New Jersey abortionist Alan Weiselberg pleaded guilty to insurance fraud and authorizing unsafe medical practices at his Woodbridge abortion clinic. This came after a plea bargain resulted in the dismissal of another 23 counts of mail and wire fraud. He also pleaded guilty on behalf of his company for conspiracy in the insurance fraud case. And on February 8th, Mississippi abortionist Joseph Booker was arraigned before a federal magistrate on five felony counts of income tax evasion and bankruptcy fraud. In Arizona, abortionist John Biskin was arrested and charged with manslaughter after a woman bled to death at his Phoenix area abortion clinic. Also arrested and charged was clinic manager Carol Stewart. Biskin and Stewart worked for a chain of abortion clinics owned by New York abortionist Moshi Hakamovich. Records show that at least six women have died following abortions performed at facilities owned by Hakamovich and approximately 30 lawsuits filed against them by injured women. 
The chain of abortion clinics also has been investigated for altering the medical records of injured clients, operating under grossly unsanitary conditions, and allowing non-physicians to perform abortions. In a similar case, the California Supreme Court has suspended the murder prosecution of San Francisco area abortionist Bruce Steer. The court said it wanted to review whether the indictment of Steer was politically motivated by prosecutors with an anti-abortion agenda. The charges stem from an abortion performed by Steer that resulted in the death of a 27-year-old Medi-Cal patient. The state claims that murder charges were brought because Steer showed conscious disregard for the woman's life after he failed to call for emergency assistance. She bled to death on her way home from his clinic. On the political front, the seat for former House Speaker Newt Gingrich has been filled through a special election. Although Gingrich has always claimed to be pro-life, he handpicked radical pro-abort Johnny Isaacson to succeed him, and his strong support enabled Isaacson to defeat pro-life candidate Christina Jeffrey. In California, newly elected Governor Gray Davis was declared automatically excommunicated from the Catholic Church by Monsignor Edward Kavanaugh. This came after the Monsignor declined an invitation to attend an inauguration service of prayer and celebration for the staunchly pro-abortion Davis. Kavanaugh stated that it would betray and scandalize the faithful for a Catholic priest to attend a political function honoring a leader of the American Holocaust. A jury in Somerset County, New Jersey, has ordered a local pro-life obstetrician to pay $1.85 million to the mother of a baby born with Down syndrome. The mother, Deborah Campano, filed a wrongful life suit against Dr. James Delahunty, claiming that he failed to offer her a prenatal test that would have revealed the abnormality. In court, she admitted that had she known the information, she would have aborted her child. In Italy, a couple whose unborn child was missing the fingers on its left hand applied for an abortion under an Italian law that allows it if the birth would cause, quote, grave trauma, unquote, to the mother. Although the parents were given permission to end the pregnancy at approximately six months, the child managed to survive the abortion and struggled for life for another month and a half before dying. And finally, a federal judge has ruled that the IRS acted properly when it took away the tax-exempt status of a church for running ads attacking Bill Clinton. Daniel Little, pastor of the church at Pierce Creek in Vessel, New York, took out the ads urging Christians not to put the economy before the Ten Commandments. The ads, which ran during the 1992 presidential campaign, detailed Clinton's support for abortion on demand, homosexuality, and condom distribution in public schools. I'm Alan Ackles, and that's Life Talk News. And now back to Mark and Zentra. Thank you, Alan. Well, Zentra, all the news wasn't bad news. There's some good news there. Lots there of sure abortionists was. going to jail. That's right. And <laughs> most of them didn't have to kill a woman in order to go to jail. They well, some of them, them did. But <laughs> right, yeah. right, yeah, unfortunately, a few of them. But right. the rest of them, it was their own just stupid life habits, the right. drugs, the... Right. The ba um, Beating up their wife. Right. Uh, or the <laughs> financial them. problems, IRS <laughs> tax evasion. Right. They did it to themselves. Just garden variety stuff that we see every That's day right. in the abortion industry. Uh, but there was some bad things, some disturbing things Just in there. Just the typical infuriating things that we have to deal with with this right. abortion issue. We have this couple in Italy who decided they didn't want to have their baby because it was missing the hand, what, the fingers. Fingers on left one hand. hand. Right. That, that, that is just absolutely twisted. And right. then there's the family in New York who sued the doctor just for letting their baby be born. Right. How, what, what are they going to say to that child later on? Oh, yeah. Well, we would have killed you had we been given the opportunity. Right. But you're here now, so we'll make the best of it. I mean, what and, do you, what and enjoy you our $2 million that, right. Right. that we got off of you. Then we had to deal with the church. That was, that was pretty infuriating. Yeah, them losing their tax-exempt status for educating the public about Bill Clinton's right. anti-biblical right. stances. When you and I saw right here in that same election cycle in, in Dallas, Texas, Jesse Jackson going from church That's to church, right. standing in the pulpit, raising money, for Bill Clinton. And they haven't touched them. Nobody said a word nope, about that. Not nope. a bit. And then on the political front also, there was the verdict against the pro-lifers in Oregon, $107 million right. that they're supposed to pay to Planned Parenthood, basically just for exercising their First Amendment right. rights. But you know, a lot of people have said, even some pro-aborts have said that'll never stand, but on the, yes. because it, it's so outrageous. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's another example of the judicial system in America mm -hmm. being completely out of right. control. In fact, I think I've heard that that court is one of the most overturned courts yeah, right. in the country. Right. Um, but, you know, they say it won't stand, but who knows? Who knows? I mean, I who mean, would have thought it would have <laughs> ever stood, stood to begin with? Right? right, who would have thought that Roe versus it's Wade would amazing. have ever stood? But, you know, um, there's been some sad news in, uh, lately that 
um, that's, that's both made me sad and made me infuriated at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's the situation in Colorado. Oh, absolutely. You know, on the sad side of the ledger, we have some people here who've been butchered in cold blood for no reason. Mm -hmm. These kids that did this didn't even make a political statement. This is just people we don't like, so we're going to kill they them. They just wanted to create mayhem, right. and that's exactly what they did. And you have families that have been destroyed, and you, you have yeah, these, children that are never going to be the same th again. These teenagers are absolutely traumatized, right. and you're right. They, they can't ever be the same. You can't turn back. I don't yes. know how they go in that school building again. I'm not sure. You think back when you're 15, 16, 17 years old, just going in that building would be a horrible situation. Yeah, I think but, so. So that's on the sad part of it. But the infuriating part on it, of it has been the response afterward. Because we have the typical scenario now of blaming all of the mechanisms by which it were, was carried out and not the motivation for it. Mm -hmm. You have all these people now coming forward saying, oh, it's the, it's the fault of the media. Um, they show so much violence on too television. Much violence, right. Well, I don't disagree with that. There is too much violence on television. Or it's the video games, which desensitize people because they show people getting killed on these video games. Or that it's guns, and we need more gun control Gun laws. control. We'll talk about that in a moment. But you know, none of those things do I disagree with. I agree that there's too much violence on television. I agree that there's too much violence in these video games. But the basic problem is, why would somebody do it even if you saw violence on television? Why, what would motivate these kids to do this? And the aggravating part is that no one is addressing the core issue here, which is that for the last 25 years, we have totally destroyed the American culture's sense of respect for human life. Oh, absolutely. There is none left. Oh. And so when we, when we kill 4,500 babies a day mm -hmm. through legal abortion, this is inevitable. This is a guarantee. This is not something that you could have never predicted. You, you basically cannot expect these kids to have a respect for human life when, they when see they're what, taught right. abs the absolute op opposite. Right. And what makes me so angry about it is that you have so-called religious people coming forward now, mm -hmm. talking about, well, gun control and talking about uh, lowering violence on television and lowering the, the violence in these video games. And then just the general hand-wringing, oh, how could this have happened? Right. Well... The reason it's happening is because those same religious leaders are too cowardly to stand up and say, the reason this is happening is because we have no respect for human life because we're killing 4,000 babies a day. Right. And I sat there and watched those services last Sunday where you had a Catholic priest get up and talk, you had Protestants get up and talk, you had uh, Franklin Graham get up and speak. Not one of them mentioned that, and every one of them knows better. Every one of them knows that... You, if people want to kill people, there'll always be a way, even with, without guns. If you picked up every gun in America and melted it down, this could have still happened. You could do the same thing with a car or with poisons or with bombs or anything. Sure. The problem is we have destroyed respect for human life in this country. And until we get beyond that, we're going to have this situation repeated over and over. And the only difference is it's going to get worse every time it happens. Yeah, I think it's inevitable. It's inevitable. And until the American people understand that we've got to re return respect for human life at all stages, you can't separate it out. You can't say we'll have no respect for this human life but total respect for this one. You can't say that. No. It's totally irrational. No, life is a continuum, and you have to have respect for the whole thing. And continuum. until they understand that, until we return to that standard, that this is an inevitable uh, they're tricking themselves by thinking gun control. That's been the big call. Sure. And it, we've even seen Slick Willie now come out and call for new federal gun control. That was predictable. Right. I'll use Texas as an example here. Um, Texas, uh, from what I understand, has the highest percentage of gun ownership in America. Uh, which, And I, I don't have any reason to doubt that those figures are probably true. And I saw something not long ago that said 70% of Texas children live in a home where there's at least one gun. I could believe that. And that there's and that that's the cause of the violence. Mm -hmm. Well, the interesting thing is if you went back 150 years in Texas history, you'd find that virtually every child lived in a home with a gun. Yeah, that makes sense. That was the standard. Right. But some children openly carried guns to school. But we didn't have these situations. No, they, they knew right. better. They had respect for human life. And you can take the guns away from these kids, and if they want to kill, they will kill. Yeah. We've got to take away from them the desire to kill. But uh, we could talk about that forever. Let's talk about the situation in Ohio. Right. Um, that's a very interesting... It, it, it really is. What, what happened is on April 7th, a woman who was going through a partial birth abortion procedure in Dayton, Ohio, um, to back up a little bit, um, she was in the middle of the three-day procedure right. where they spend several days dilating her before actually extracting the baby. 
in the middle of it, she went into labor. She went, she went to the ER with abdominal cramps and delivered a 22-week-old baby. And the baby actually survived after the delivery for about three hours or so. Right. And th this, uh, unlike some, we know this goes on other times, but unlike other times, this actually made it into the media. Right. Uh, one of the women who took care of her, the baby at the hospital while she survived, has wanted to make sure that her story is known and that she is not forgotten. And now all the doctors and nurses that were involved are having to get counseling. Yes. And th the most outrageous thing, it it's outrageous on one hand, but it's very educational on the other hand is their pro-abortion response to this they're calling it a publicity stunt they never mentioned the baby um, they do not have the decency to, to even acknowledge that this baby came out they can't but, because because then they're admitting that what they were doing is killing a baby right. because the only thing that went wrong here is the baby survived yes yeah, so it's very interesting how right. they have to just totally ignore that issue they don't even tiptoe around right. it they're blatantly ignoring that. well in a minute we're gonna see that interview that you did with Kelly mm -hmm. and it's gonna reinforce that this situation that happened in Ohio is not at all unusual absolutely not but um, first let's take a few moments to uh, listen to this message and when we come back we're gonna be having that Kelly interview. Yeah, I'm pro-life, and I'd really like to get involved, but I just don't know what to do. I'll tell you what you can do. You can become a spy for life, and you don't need a trench coat, a secret Dakota ring, or a gazillion dollars worth of electronic gadgets. The information we need to shut down the death camps is all around you. Sometimes it's a malpractice suit hidden away in some dusty filing cabinet at your courthouse. It could be a tiny article buried deep in the metro section of your local newspaper or something you've been saving in a shoebox for the last 10 years. We've even seen abortionists put in jail with information they threw out in their own garbage. Well, the fact is, anyone can be a spy for life. So roll up your sleeves and get to work. We need whatever dirt you can dig up about any abortionist, abortion clinic, clinic employee, or hospital that allows abortions. Send it to Spies for Life. Care of Life Dynamics, Post Office Box 2226, Denton, Texas 76202. Let's get started today. It's an exciting, legal, and cheap way you can help stop the killing. And you may remain anonymous. Okay, we're back. You know, one of the things that Life Dynamics does is we do a lot of spying, infiltration of the abortion industry, uh, kind of agent provocateur type things, and sometimes people question why we do that. Even pro-life people have been critical of us for doing that sort of thing. But the reality is, if you want to beat an oppo opponent, you better know what they're all about. Um, we get information directly out of the abortion industry that we can't get anywhere else and that we can then use to go after them with. Um, you're about to see an interview with one of our spies. This woman came to us uh, quite some time ago very upset over some things that she had seen in her job in the uh, abortion industry. I want to tell you now that this is a very difficult interview to watch because you're going to hear things that you probably didn't know were going on, um, descriptions of, it's not so much gory as it is just kind of heartbreaking and, and wrenching to think that our society has come to this point. Um, Zentra did this interview uh, about a month ago and uh, it was very difficult for her to do. And, and again, it's going to be very difficult for you to listen to. But I think if you're going to be serious about this, if we're going to be serious about closing down these death camps, and that's what they are, they are death camps, uh, this is a holocaust. And if this interview doesn't convince you of that, uh, you're probably not convincible. So um, be forewarned, it's not pretty, but it's something that we all need to listen to. To start with, just so that everybody understands, your real name is not Kelly, is that correct? That's correct. Why don't you start by telling us how long did you work for the abortion clinic? Well, for one, I did not work for an abortion clinic as an employee. I worked for an outside source hired with a team to go in and dissect and procure fetal tissue, basically to dissect tissue for high quality cells. Okay, so you were actually working for an outside company that was gathering fetal tissue, but you were doing this inside the clinic? Right, but we were never employees of the abortion clinic. What we did was we would have a contract with an abortion clinic that would allow a certain number of us to go in there on certain days, and we would procure fetal tissue for research. We would get a generated list each day to tell us what tissue researchers uh, pharmaceutical companies, universities were looking for 
Then we would go and look at the patient charts. We had to screen out all the ones we didn't want. What I mean by that is that we would not use anything that had STDs or fetal anomalies. These had to be the most perfect specimens we could give the researchers for the best value that we could sell for. What gestational ages were you talking about for these babies? Um, we would look starting at seven weeks all the way up to 30 plus. All the way to over 30 weeks gestation. You were harvesting parts from aborted babies? That's correct. That's correct. And we, we were looking anywhere from eyes, livers, brains, thymuses, and especially cardiac blood, uh, core blood, the blood from the liver, even blood from the limbs that we would get from the veins. Now, just a minute ago, you said that you had to screen out all the babies with abnormalities. Right. But when you're talking about a babies at 30 weeks gestation, wouldn't the majority of these abortions be for abnormalities? No, I mean, there was only probably a 2% that had abnormalities. The rest were very healthy donors. And how we knew that they were healthy was, one, we would check to see if they, the mother had any prenatal care that suggested she had birth defects. That was the reason why she was there to have the abortion. But 95% of the time, no. It was just that she was there to get rid of the baby. So how many of the later terms, the ones that are around 30 weeks or so, would you see in a week? Probably an estimate of 30 or 40 a week. Of the late terms? Of the late terms. Of the late terms. That's anywhere from 22 weeks all the way up to 30 weeks plus. Let's talk a bit about how you worked with the researchers. You said it was universities and pharmaceutical That's companies. That's correct. And also private contractors who would, um, we would sell them the tissue. They would in turn collect the cells and then in turn sell those cells to other universities and other researchers. So basically there was a high demand every week from universities and pharmaceutical companies throughout the world just to buy fetal tissue. How did you get these specimens to the researchers? Every researcher that we sold to had their own private way they wanted it shipped, whether it was um, UPS, FedEx, Airborne, or a special courier that they would just... We would take the specimen in a box to the airport and put it on its regular cargo, and they would pick it up at their destination. Do you think these shipping companies knew that they were transporting aborted baby no. parts? No, all they knew was that it was just human sales, when it actually wasn't sales. We're talking sometimes it would be a completely intact fetus, or it might be a batch of eyes, or 30 to 40 livers going out that day, or thymuses. Whatever it may be, there was mass quantities of it going out. The babies at the clinic, the aborted ones that you didn't take parts out of, or you didn't ship the entire body, how did you dispose of them? If they could, we would usually put it down the garbage disposal along with the placenta and the leftover blood material and that would just get down the drain. If it was large enough and wouldn't go down the drain, they had a special freezer and we would freeze all the, it may be a total of 60 to 70 fetuses in one box, frozen in a freezer to be picked up in a month's time for incineration. How is it that you came to be talking to Life Dynamics? I mean, you're working in this abortion clinic gathering fetal parts. It seems like we'd be the last people you'd want to talk to. Well, when I was working, there was an incident that came my way and my staff's way that there was a set of twins at 24 weeks gestation brought back to us. These twins were both in a pan and they were both alive meaning that there was maybe just a couple of nicks from the tongs that had pulled them out, but these fetuses were moving and gasping for air. And the doctor came back and basically looked at us and said, got you some good specimens, twins. And I looked at him and said, there's something wrong here. Uh, they are moving. I don't do this. This is not in my contract. So they just brought you these babies and said, here, do whatever you want with That's them. That's correct. And I told him, I would not be any part of extinguishing their lives. So he basically got a bottle of sterile water 
and poured it in the pans until the fluid ran up to their mouths and nose and basically let them drown themselves, which didn't take very long. And I, I did not stay in the room to watch that. I left the room because I would not watch those fetuses moving. So he basically, I mean not basically, what he did do was kill those babies outside the mother's womb. That's correct. After they'd been born. That's correct. And, in, and then we as the staff did procure fetal tissue from those um, under protest. Do you know how long it took those babies to die? No, because we left the room. I, I would not watch. Mm -hmm. And that's basically when I decided that it was wrong. Basically, I, I did not want to be there when that happened because after that incident, there was more times that we had live births come back to us. Really? 16 weeks, all the way up to sometimes even 30 weeks. And the doctor would either break the neck or take a pair of tongs and basically beat the fetus until it was dead. Do you think the doctor ever altered the procedures to get you the type of specimens you needed for yes, that Yes, every day? day when we would go in to do procedures, the doctor would come in along with his nurse and they would want to see the list of what we were going to procure and what we needed. Then he would basically get us the most complete intact specimen that he could get us. And what I mean by that is that all the limbs, the arms, the head, the chest cavity, were never invaded. They were all completely intact. Sometimes, if the fetus was, appeared to be dead, but when you open up the chest cavity, you do see the heart beating, but there's no arms or legs moving. So they were intentionally altering their type of procedure to give you an intact specimen, even if that meant giving you a live specimen. That's correct. Just so we could sell better tissue and more tissue out so that our company would make more money. And at the end of the year, they would actually give the clinic back more money since we got good specimens. So they were basically trying to keep your company's business and maybe get a little extra out of your company. And that's why they were changing the procedures for yes, you. Yes, that, that's correct. When you have a second trimester abortion, you have to have a certain number of lamma cells placed in the vagina to dilate the cervix. And that way, when you go in after your third day procedure, and they would change out these lambs on the third day. They would pull the lambs, the fetus would come out. But in the motel room, sometimes these lambs would move. What are these lambs you're talking about? They're a dilator. They're, they're made up of some type of seaweed. They're hard when they go in, and they dilate you just like you're giving birth. But when they sent these women to the motel room, because they had to stay in town, sometimes these lambs would fall out, and she would go into labor and the fetus would expel itself out. So these women were basically having a two-day procedure, and the first day they were dilated L with lambs. the laminaria. Lambs. And then they'd go to this hotel overnight, expecting to come back for their abortion the following right. day. Right, right. But instead, they'd go into labor. Right. In the hotel room. Right. And then they would give us a call um, to, the, to the nurse, and the nurse would call the doctor, and they would go to the motel room and pick up the woman and the fetus. Were these fetuses coming out alive? Yes, they were coming out alive. And they would bring back the fetus in a bucket, along with the placenta and the mother. They had to get resuction, so they brought her back to the clinic. And that's when they would give us a call during the night and say, okay, we've got a bunch couple of specimens here for you or we've got one specimen. We would then go and the specimen would be in a bucket and then we would empty it out. And when we knew that it was alive is when you opened up the chest cavity the heart was still beating. Sometimes you could even see movement in the bucket. They had to come out alive. There was, there was no way for those fetuses to be coming out dead. They were all alive. And how they maintained them, or did they kill them in there, was anybody's guess. My guess is that they had to kill them in the bucket, or put them in a corner and let them die slowly. Because the doctor had seen how strongly you reacted to That's seeing correct. them killed That's in correct. front of you. So that, he made... He made sure he did not repeat those instances, but they kept happening anyway, and, and that's... 
how I came to call you guys. How did they treat the women who were coming in for abortions? Well, that would basically depend on the woman and her attitude. The majority of the time, it was not very pleasant. There was an episode a couple of times that we would see she wanted to have an abortion one day, but the second day she came back, and even though she had the lamisils placed in her, um, she wanted to keep the baby, but they would not they would not do that. They would talk her out of it, saying, well, we've already placed these lambs. You're going to have the abortion. Did the clinic know she could have been taken to a hospital and they would have basically been able to... Change her mind, yes. Yeah, help yeah. her continue the pregnancy? She was never given that option. She was always... Um, the patient was always told by the doctor and all of the staff gathered around, uh, pressuring her to have that abortion. Before they even began the procedures, did you see any sort of coercing the women into that? Well, when, you, when you're talking about coercing, you have to talk about... Um, they're given an IV sedation on the second day, the day that they're going to have the procedure. And the IV sedation kind of puts them into what I call a, a NyQuil nap. I mean, they're just basically drowsy. They're not really thinking for themselves. So that's basically how they were coerced into having a procedure. When you could blatantly hear them in the halls changing their mind, uh, telling them they didn't want to have it done. Mm -hmm. But they were forced into having it done by giving more sedation. So they would withdraw their consent, but then the clinic would drug them and, that's and, correct. and continue the procedure. That's correct. What about, you mentioned in a previous conversation, the attitude of a lot of the lesbian employees. Right. That kind of had a lot of our staff concerned. Once the patient was unconscious, lying on a table, some of the women would make comments, basically of the genitalia area. Um, nice tattoo, or this one looks really nice, what do you think? So they were just being generally degrading to the Very women. Very degrading to the women that were in there. And this is while the women were unconscious? Right. While they're unconscious, while they didn't know what was going on. So these employees are walking around looking at the right. patients. They were walking around talking to them. There's even been episodes where phone numbers were taken off the charts and people would give them a call weeks down the road asking them out for drinks. It was not uncommon for women or men at the clinic to hit on these women for dates. Line 5. It's Mark Crutcher's explosive new book about American women being sexually assaulted, mutilated, and killed inside this nation's abortion clinics. And it's about a legal system that stacks the deck against these women while pro-choice organizations protect abortionists they know to be dangerous. It's also about an agency of the U.S. government using taxpayer money in a massive cover-up of abortion industry disasters and a link between abortion and breast cancer that's quietly being swept under the rug. Lime 5 takes you behind the scenes of the American abortion industry for an uncensored look at how women have been lied to, exploited, and betrayed. To order your copy of this shocking and fully documented book, call 1-800-401-6494. It's guaranteed to change the way you look at legalized abortion forever, or your money will be refunded. Call now, 1-800-401-6494. Welcome back. In the last segment, I told you we'd be having a special guest join us to discuss the Kelly interview. Before I introduce him, I want to take a moment to make sure you appreciate what an incredible situation this is. You know, over the years, we've seen lots of high-profile pro-aborts come over to our side, but the thought that Eric Hara could one day be one of them is absolutely mind-boggling. Having this guy be the very first guest on the very first episode of Life Talk had to be the work of the Lord. No mere human being could conceive of something so implausible. So as living proof that with God anything is possible, I want you to meet my new friend, Eric Hara. Eric, welcome to Life Dynamics. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Mark. It's my pleasure. Eric, tell us why it's so implausible that you're here. <laughs> well, up until 14 months ago, I, I had been involved in the abortion industry for um, over a decade, close to 12 years, and um, was considered to be one of the largest abortionists in the country. 
And I think even more profound than that was the, the simple fact that I hated your guts and couldn't stand you. And <laughs> Wow, a sweetheart like me. Yeah, a sweetheart like you. Maybe that's why I never got those Christmas cards. Must got lost in the mail. You know, I kept looking for him, and, and, I, and it, was just, it was heartbreaking it, that I never got it, Christmas cards. It was cards. really tragic. He was a total wreck for the whole month of yeah, December. Yeah, just I, never got him. Yeah, I, I, I kind of felt <laughs> bad about that. Yeah, I bet you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, only now, huh? Yes. Only now, right, in <laughs> retrospect. Yeah, exactly. Um, I know, on a, on a serious note, I know that, um, that you watched the Kelly interview. Yes. And, uh, of course, as you better than most would know how difficult that was. Uh, for her to, to talk about. And, and I want to discuss that interview, some of the things that she said and some of the things that you'd seen yourself. But before I do, I want to advance a theory, and I want to see if you agree or disagree or with this or think I'm crazy or whatever. Um, while this whole partial birth abortion debate has been going on for the last several years, one of the things that's always been questionable is why would the pro-aborts fight so hard to keep it? Because an, a, a total ban on, on partial birth abortion does not save any babies. It doesn't outlaw any abortions. All it says is you can't kill them with this method. Mm -hmm. So they could still go kill them with DNEs or salines or whatever, mm -hmm. other, other late-term procedures. So why do they fight so viciously to keep it? That was always something that kind of bugged me about why they would want to do this. Right. Now, then we started working with Kelly. Now, we've worked with her for about a year and a half, two years now. Um, and as you know, we have lots of spies inside the abortion clinics. I know that all too well. Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, we get a lot of information out that helps mm -hmm. us uh, in our pro-life work through that. But um, with Kelly, we got some information that, that we didn't get anyplace else mm -hmm. because we started getting all this stuff about fetal tissue acquisition and selling baby parts and selling whole babies and so forth. And suddenly it dawned on me why they want partial birth abortions or DNX abortions. With the other procedures, you don't have anything to sell at the end. You got a mass of, of dead tissue. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You got a bunch of arms and legs and eyes laying around, but you can't do anything with them. Exactly. The only difference between the other late procedures and the DNX is you got something you can sell. Exactly. This is a maximizing the profits thing. Uh, they sell the woman the abortion to begin with, make several thousand dollars off that on some of these real late term procedures, and then they maximize profits by selling the dead baby that they take out of her but you got to take it out whole or you don't have anything to sell. I mean, am I way off base or is that? No, no, you're, you're, you're probably one of the very few on, on the pro-life side who, who come to, to a, a true realization of, about why that procedure is so guarded by the pro-abortion side. It has nothing to do with a woman's right to choose or protecting the sanctity of the right of abortion. It has to do with protecting the sanctity of the fullness of the abortionist's wallet. Right. Right, that, and that's why they fight this thing so viciously. That's why they fight for all abortions, but especially right. this type, because, you, you know, this is the only type of abortion procedure that it doesn't cost you money to get rid of the dead baby. Right. The other procedures, it cost them money to get rid of the dead baby. Here, not only did they get anywhere from three to $8,000 for performing that abortion, they get money for giving that baby right. away. Right. It's a brilliant business move. I mean, um, from a business standpoint, it makes perfect sense. I, Why? I think, unfortunately, a right. lot of abortionists are very good at business. <laughs> right, yeah, well, we all know that's true. Let me ask you something about um, a subject that, that Kelly brought up. You know, the abortion industry would have you believe that this, this concept of live birth is something that just never happens or it's so rare it's not even worth talking about. To hear her say it, though, I mean, she was talking about what? Um, she said she saw three to four in a a two-week period. Right. The live yeah. b babies that she's... On a regular basis, not just right. like there was, they were having a special on late terms that month right. or something, but on a regular basis, she was seeing them that often. Right. Um, is that something you experienced? I mean, did you see live birth in, in your clinics? Uh, along with sexual abuse of patients and sexual abuse of, of female staff members, in the abortion industry that, that the live birth situation is one of the abortion industry's dirty little secrets that, that isn't talked about very much. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and they're probably going to be quite upset that you're exposing it. Oh, and they sure always are when you expose right. things, Mark. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, every time we lift up the rock and exactly. watch what scurries around exactly. around. Exactly. You always pick something it. out and throw it out there. You know, and, and that's the thing about lifting rocks. There's mm -hmm. never anything pretty exactly. underneath a rock. No. You know, it's always something no, it's slimy not. like this. What, what did your clinic do when you had a live birth? What was your response? Um, 
it, it was always very disturbing. The, the doctors tried to keep it hidden mm -hmm. from the rest of the staff yeah, because sure. it would upset the staff because, you know, we weren't dealing with anything alive. These, right. these weren't babies. These were fetuses. These were masses of tissue. Um, so the, the doctor would, would usually inject it with medication or, or do something more, more drastic to, to cover it up. You know, she mentioned um, this concept that I, I never had thought about before, but obviously it makes sense from a medical standpoint where they put laminary in some woman, send her off to a hotel mm -hmm. to spend the night and do the procedure the next day, but she goes into labor mm -hmm. and delivers a live baby, mm -hmm. which is then taken to the abortion clinic living to be killed mm -hmm. and, and the parts harvested out of it. Um, did you ever have a situation like that? or? Yes, and in and, 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 and most of my clinics we performed um, late-term abortions, impartial birth abortions, and we would always find a little hotel or motel nearby. And I remember this one time, we, we had a patient who came in for about a 26-week abortion. And she had been inserted with Laminaria, and we had put her up at what we, what we would call at that time Hotel Death, and that was our nickname for it. And it was right down the road from the clinic. And she called up in the middle of the night saying that she had delivered this baby. Well, she had to call us because we give her paperwork that says you're not, you're not allowed to call 911. You're not allowed to go to a hospital. You're not allowed to call your family doctor because, you know, you cannot let these things be seen publicly that, that this stuff happens. She brought the baby back in a white cotton hotel towel that you find in any ordinary hotel. And the baby was put into what was called a scrub room which is where the babies were processed. And as I was standing there w with a nurse, I happened to look over. I said, that towel just moved. Oh, she goes, Eric, you're crazy. You're just tired. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. And I looked again. I said, that towel is moving. And we both looked over. And at that time, this little baby's arm raised up out of the towel and was moving like a newborn baby would, would move. And I, I remember I literally screamed and you know ran out of the room. And the doctor came in and closed the door. And when we went back to process the baby out of the clinic into the lab, um, he had a puncture wound in his chest that had been placed there with a parasurgical scissors by the physician. So obviously that happened at the, at the clinic. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes so that killed. baby was like what she was saying, was brought there alive. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And exactly. even by our standards of allowing abortion on demand mm -hmm. through all nine months of pregnancy, that's still a murder. Now, legally, in every state in the union, that is murder because right. even in New York, with the most liberal abortion laws in the country, if you have a live birth, you are supposed to do everything within your power right. to, to, um, you know, to keep this baby alive to the point that New York requires a second physician in the room after a certain point in gestation so that if the baby is born alive, that one physician will look after the woman and the other physician will look mm -hmm. after the baby. But that law is not even enforced. Right. I mean, we see that consistently, the mm -hmm. laws that are meant to protect women or protect mm -hmm. uh, the sanctity of life even in some cases are just totally ignored. By exactly. Do they just become so callous that they can do these? I mean, does doing abortions really harden your heart that, that badly? I did. I, I remembered that, that I, I didn't feel anything. At first, I used to hate to hear the suction machine. Then as time went on, that suction machine sound that I found to be so offensive suddenly became like a cast register to me. It was, it was, it was music to my ears. And I stab people with, you know, no fetus can beat us. You rape it, we scrape it. Mm -hmm. I can remember seeing two physicians one time after they performed a partial birth abortion take the baby and literally pull on the legs like it was a wishbone at, at Thanksgiving and make jokes about it. Who can get the bigger bone whose wish would come true? You know, people think that's so outrageous, but it we happens. found it happens. And, and I wrote a chapter uh, in line five, uh, the book that I wrote about the internal workings of the abortion industry, mm -hmm. we had a chapter on those sort of things mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. how these people become so desensitized to all right. this. We found them playing catch with the babies out in the hallway. Stand and, them up and like right. little puppets and, right. and stuff. And, that, and, and moving that, them around the facility as pranks for other staff Oh yeah, workers. exactly. Yeah. And, and, and that doesn't happen, Zentra, just at what Planned Parenthood would call a, a, a regular clinic. This happens at Planned Parenthood. Oh, yeah. And yeah. this happens at yeah. hospital abortion facilities and private mm -hmm. doctor's offices. And, and the reason they do that is because they have to joke about it because no matter how big of an abortionist you are, no matter how big of an abortionist you work for, every one of them knows deep down in their heart that they're committing murder. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's, that was always one of my arguments when I used to train people how to argue the pro-life position. Mm -hmm. I'd say, 
you know, you're wasting your time to go out here and stand in front of an abortionist and say, oh, you're committing murder. You're he knows murder. he is. He knows it better than he you He knows do. he is. But he also knows that he has that million-dollar home. Right. He vacations six weeks out of the year. Right. His mm -hmm. kids all have brand-new BMWs. Right. And so, you know, his wife has his has her gold charge card that she can go buy her, her, her fur coats with. Mm -hmm. and, and so he knows. Right. But in his heart... The money means more than life, and right. and, and Mark and, and our society that seems to be the case in a lot of different oh absolutely avenues that absolutely. we deal in. Mm -hmm. You know something you had brought up. Um, yeah, about a question I had about um, some of Kelly's concerns. She mentioned on the video mm -hmm. tape that she was very concerned for her own safety and that of her family, and that sh she went to even you know greater fears discussing it with us off tape. You know, we went to great mm -hmm. lengths to make sure that her face wasn't shown on the tape, and you know how. We altered her she voice. Will, and yeah, and she will always, you know, remain clandestine, mm -hmm. and she's very afraid of what the abortionists will do mm -hmm. if they find out that she's leaking this information. Mm -hmm. are, are these fears reasonable? So, is that true? They're, they're more than reasonable. They, 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 they happen, and, and, and she has every right to be concerned and, and the effort that, that both you and Mark took to, to ensure her confidentiality and her anonymity you know it, it was the right thing to or is the right thing to do let's face it we're, we're dealing with the industry that is a multi-billion dollar industry mm -hmm. the abortion industry and we're dealing with companies now that are major u.s conglomerates that are harvesting these body parts and who have killed for much less oh absolutely and and i think she has every right to, to be careful but that fear that she lives in and that a lot of people in the abortion industry live in is 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 not as bad as the internal torment that they're faced with and, and I, I simply would advise anybody to who wants to get out of the business to get out call you up call it call another right to life organization mm -hmm. you know but 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 get out and, and they'll be protected just right. the way i was right. and, and yes. they'll be okay yeah. everybody that we've helped out or dealt with or even some of our people like her that are still mm -hmm. in that are still working with us they all have this fear you know we've had many of them say they'll kill me Right. Mm. They literally will kill me if they find out what I'm in doing. In fact, I don't think there's a one we've talked to who they didn't hasn't, say that. Ha yeah, who wasn't I, just I, sure I that, that that person was. I going had to that me. fear, and and luckily the, the Lord had had His hand on me. Um, I I would advise people to to call you. You, you know, you, you have been blessed with, with the ability to protect people if you have right. to and to take people in and stuff like that. And, and I would I would caution people to, to deal, if they want to get out of the abortion industry, deal with a reputable right-to-life group such as Life Dynamics or some of the other ones There's lots that, of mm -hmm. that help people exit out of the abortion industry. Right. But, you know, to deal with somebody reputable, you know, like yourself. And, and, and there is help and hope. There absolutely is. And... Yes. Um, just to let, let the audience know, we, you and I are now going to start working together uh, yes. on mm -hmm. some new projects, and that's going to be really exciting. Very exciting. And we're going to have some new things out there for people um, to keep abortion clinics out of their community or get them out if they're there. Or, um, you know, and, and I've told people this time and time again, it's ten times easier to keep one out than it is to get it out mm -hmm. once it's there. It, definitely. And, but it seems like the pro-life community doesn't rally until there's already one there. And if you can if you can work prior to that mm -hmm. to see that it never happens, you know why would you want to cure a disease rather than prevent it? Well, w once again, I, I think we see life dynamics taking on the leadership role that you've taken on years ago and being proactive, not reactive, right. and getting people to the point where while we sit around and while we stew over the fact that we lost partial birth abortion. Well, we can work to make sure that we don't get a clinic in our towns so those abortions will never take place to begin well, with. Well, listen, and, I, 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 I've said this for years, and I know that this is your position. Abortion is not going to end in Washington, D.C., no. and it's not going to end in the state capitol. Mm -hmm. Nobody in Austin, Texas is going to end abortion in Denton, Texas. Right. Nobody in Springfield, Illinois is going to end it in you know, exactly. Elgin, Illinois. Mm -hmm. The pro-life community needs to understand that if, if they want to stop abortion in their community, they're going to have to do it. Exactly. And if they're not going to, then just accept it. They're going to kill babies in your community, exactly. and that's the way it's going to be. Mm -hmm. I, I know, as I travel all around the country and all around the world speaking, that the right to life community is tired, Mark. And I understand they, they, they fought for many years, but you know what? The other side is not tired. They, they, they are gloating in their, in their little victories. They, 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 are, they are celebrating the fact that they've almost had eight years now of free reign. And I say it's time that we get prepared for the new millennium and go take back some of that ground that You're was absolutely taken from right. us. And I'm excited about what we're going to be able to do exactly. working together. And, um, you know, I, I still say 
uh, we're at the point now where this is a test of wills. The, the real question before us today is, do we want to stop the killing worse than they want to kill? Exactly. And the answer to that question is going to be is going to determine the, mm -hmm. the future of the abortion battle. So I welcome you onto our side, and I'm looking forward to the collaboration that we're going to do. And I I am, I am happy and thrilled and honored to, to be associated with you and Zentra and the rest of your fine staff at Life Dynamics. Well, thank you very much, and we're happy to have you. Thank you. It's a fact. The most frequently read part of any newspaper is the editorial page. It's also a fact that Life Dynamics can provide you with more than 400 pro-life letters to the editor that you can copy, combine, and customize to literally dominate the abortion debate in your local newspaper. Remember, more revolutions have been won with printing presses than with guns. And this book is guaranteed to give you the firepower you need to duke it out with the most aggressive abortion defenders in your area and win. To get your copy of Letters to the Editor, send just $10 to the address on the screen. For MasterCard and Visa customers, you may call toll-free 1-800-401-6494. Call today. Once again, that toll-free number is 1-800-401-6494. You know, if you don't want to compromise on something, the best way to do that is to convince the decision makers, in this case the American people, that a compromise already exists. That's what the pro aborts have been doing to us for the last 26 years. How many times have you heard a politician when cornered on the abortion issue say, I support the Roe versus Wade compromise on abortion. I'm not for abortion on demand, but I think there has to be some middle ground and Roe versus Wade is it. That person is lying to you. Roe versus Wade is not a compromise. But the problem is most pro-lifers have not informed themselves about Roe versus Wade to the extent that they can argue about it. Let me tell you what the realities are. On January 22, 1973, there were two Supreme Court decisions issued on, on abortion. One is called Roe versus Wade. It's the one that most people have heard about. But there was a second decision issued that day that is just as important that you never hear discussed. It was called Doe versus Bolton. It was a case that brought out of Georgia. Here's what they did. The Supreme Court justices at the time, led by um, Harry Blackman, who just recently died, knew that the American people would not support absolute abortion on demand. But that's what these people wanted. They were radical, foaming at the mouth pro-aborts, and they wanted abortion on demand right up to the moment of birth. For any reason whatsoever, for no reason whatsoever, by a girl of any age, without parental knowledge, without parental consent, and paid for with tax dollars. That's what they wanted, but they knew the American people wouldn't stand for that. So they wrote Roe versus Wade, and they installed into Roe versus Wade certain restrictions. Oh, you can't have an abortion after this period. You can't have one for these reasons. You can't have one in the third trimester. Except that they put a little out in it. They put the, def the word health in there. They said, state regulation protective of fetal life after viability has both logical and biological justifications. And if a state is interested in protecting fetal life after viability, it may proscribe abortion during that period except when it is necessary to preserve the life or health of the mother. The problem is they didn't tell you what health meant. They did that on purpose. And then they took the extraordinary step of issuing a second decision on abortion that day called Doe versus Bolton in which they included the word health. They did this because they knew the decision that would get all the attention is Roe versus Wade and this, this decision over here, Doe versus Bolton, would be forgotten about. But it's actually the decision that made abortion legal right up to the moment of birth because in Doe versus Bolton they tell you what health means. Quote, in the light of all factors, physical, emotional, psychological, familial, and the woman's age, relevant to the well-being of the patient, all of these factors may relate to health. Well, clearly, there is no circumstance under which a woman can be pregnant that the pregnancy does not threaten her health if this is the definition of health. They knew exactly what they were doing. And that's why today, if you see a, a piece of legislation attempting in, on abortion in your legislature, the pro-aborts always want to make sure there's an exception to that, to that restriction based on the word health, because they are smart enough to know 
that if you have an exception for health, you have no bill whatsoever. There is no way to prosecute under legislation for abortion if it has an exception for the word for the mother's health. This is why I've always said that this man that just died, Harry Blackman, is one of the most evil people that ever lived on this earth. He sentenced millions of children to death and did not have the guts to just step up and say, I believe abortion on demand should be legal. He used this trick that the pro aborts now have glummed onto and used repeatedly in state legislature after state legislature after state legislature, and even on the national level, when we had the attempt to ban partial birth abortions, these people were adamant that it had to have a health exception because they knew a health exception meant there was no bill at all. So the next time someone argues with you that Roe versus Wade was a compromise, you point out to them that they're either grossly uninformed or they're lying. Now we'll be with you again next month for another issue, edition of Pro-Life 101 in which we will try to educate you about abortion related issues and show you how you can go out and expose the lie of this thing to the American people. Well, we're back. Now that class is out. That was a great explanation, Mark. Thank you. Now everybody knows that the bril your brilliance is not limited to the light reflecting off your head. Well, you've been waiting all week to say that. I have, as a matter of fact. Right. <laughs> now you know I'm just not a, another pretty face from Texas, right? That's what you've always believed. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I've oh, always yeah, right. believed. Mm, yeah. um, let's talk a little bit uh, about the things that Life Dynamics is up to right now. We just completed the Quack the Ripper project. Right. And um, it has been a resounding success. Absolutely. The, it's the, done um, exactly the response that we right, desired. that we set out to do. People, uh, first off, let me tell you what, what Quack the Ripper is, if for the audience that may not need be aware of it. It's a joke book where we sent out jokes lampooning abortionists, making fun of abortionists, using their own words. The vast majority of the jokes in here are just um, uh, graphics attached to things that they said, you know, mm -hmm. how horrible it is, or I don't have a, a life with a wife and a kids and a picket fence and all that, so we, right. you know, made jokes around right. that. We threw in a few lawyer and right. blonde type jokes yeah, also. Yeah, we stole some lawyer jokes mm -hmm. and put them in here. And admittedly, some of them are, are crude, but we're going after a secular audience, which is the, the medical community. Matter of fact, that's who we mailed it to. We mailed it to 100,000 physicians, residents, and medical school students. Mm -hmm. The reason we're doing this is the National Abortion Federation has got a very aggressive campaign now to recruit abortionists. Their mills are shutting down, and it's scaring the devil out of them. Right. They're, they're having to do everything they can to right. recruit abortionists to the extent that they're having these abortionist appreciation days oh, yeah. to try right. to keep the ones there who, who are still are there, doing it. Right, who are hanging on. Mm -hmm. So um, we're trying to counter that by going into these same environments that they're recruiting abortionists and saying, no, you're not going to be seen as the the crusaders for women and the gallant heroes of society. Right. You're the scum of the society. Mm -hmm. Here's what people really think about you. Right. People are not going to want you right. as a tenant in their property. Right. Of course, we had done something similar this years ago called called bottom feeder. Um, that was very effective as well. The New York Times did an article on bottom feeder where they went into uh, medical schools. And in one school mm -hmm. they went into, they found three students there who said they were going to work in an abortion clinic or perform abortions when they got out of school who said they were not going to simply on the on the strength of that joke book. And that was just three students at one in school. one school who were willing to admit it. Obviously right. there are going to be more who right. aren't going to come forward and say, oh, I was going to do abortions. Well, something is obviously causing mm -hmm. this. I'm not going to say that Life Dynamics mm -hmm. can take total credit for it. Yeah. But the fact is, as you and I know, um, there are 40% fewer abortion clinics in the United States today than there were just four years ago. That's right. We so, did the research to find that out. The Alan Guttmacher Institute right. at about the same time did was doing the, the same, same, same study and right. came up with very similar numbers. Right. So, and of course then we, you and I wrote a book called Access, The Key mm -hmm. to Pro-Life right. Victory, a little magazine, and we, we've put out over 160,000 of those now, and we still have a few left, mm -hmm. and people can call the office and we'll send them one for free. But it's clear the pro-life side is winning this battle. We are going to win. There's no doubt about that. And uh, we're going to keep up the pressure. And they're going to find it hard to recruit. This combined, the, the direct mail stuff that we do, and we've got another direct mail piece now that we're, that we're in the process of, of mm -hmm. uh, designing. Um, the direct mail things that we do plus the malpractice campaign 
to discourage uh, is very discouraging right. to abortionists. It they is. don't want to be out there where right. people are looking for ways to sue right. them. I, I, want, I want to point out something that really shows how successful these types of campaigns are. This file right here right. is the response we got just from Canada, where, which was right. really only a small percentage of our mailing. Very tiny percentage. Of just irate responses, right. newspaper articles about. We were getting a newspaper ripper. article a day for about two or three right. weeks there. It was amazing. Right. And of course, the nice thing is, every time they write an article, it's like multiplying the effect of our mail. Yeah, it's it's like sending right. crack to all the people who received right. their newspaper. Right. And beyond that, the police were calling us. Now they right. all were very clear that we did not have any sort of legal Anything problems. Illegal, right. But they were getting calls from these right. physicians, and many of them were not abortionists. In fact, the vast majority of them were right. not. Who felt threatened by this Which mailing. Which is really strange. And we went out of our way to make sure there was nothing threatening in right. this. We took out jokes that we wanted to right. use. That's exactly right. What I want to say to you, though, is this. Um, Life Dynamics has got a lot of projects that we're doing. A lot of things that we know for a fact. We've tested them. Um, they will work. They will shut down the abortion mills. Um, the pro-life movement is going to win. Believe me, that's, that's, a, that's a given. We are going to win. This killing is not going to continue. These death camps are going to shut down. This Holocaust is going to end. The question is just how and when this is going to happen. How many babies have to die and how many mothers have to get butchered before the killing stops? If you like the things that Life Dynamics is doing, if you know that we're being effective, I want to really encourage you to financially support us because without your support, we cannot continue these things. Um, if you don't send us money to do these things, they're not going to get done because no one else in the country is doing them. And so as you're sending in your money for your next Life Talk subscription or for a year subscription, remember that $3.50 a month doesn't even pay the cost of Life Talk, much less the cost of our malpractice campaign or our direct mail campaign or any of the other things that we're involved in and some of the things that we've got on the drawing boards. And I can tell you, the surveillance that we do, like the interviews that you've seen today, uh, or that resulted in the interviews that, we've seen, that you've seen today, uh, that stuff is not cheap. But it's extremely, extremely valuable because we are saving lives with the things that we're doing. So please, consider supporting Life Dynamics uh, in the things that we're doing. Send in a little bit more with that check, or a whole lot more. Uh, we're not going to limit you. If you want to send in, you know, two and a half million dollars, ten million, we don't, you know, we won't turn that down. So do what you can to support us, and uh, it would be very much appreciated. Mark Crutcher is the most dangerous anti-abortionist in America. I can't impress upon any of you how seriously you need to take this organization. LDI's emergence has many abortion rights supporters worried. Life Dynamics is the scariest and nastiest anti-choice group around. Life Dynamics has become renowned among abortion rights activists as the new bad kid on the block. I think that we cannot underestimate the determination of Life Dynamics to destroy us. And they have found an exceedingly dangerous tool. What we have found out about life dynamics is they're smart. They're smart enough to come up with at least palpable arguments that make some sense. I've got to hand it to life dynamics. They are on to something uh, very disturbing, and I don't know what we do about it. Life Dynamics, a Texas-based anti-choice organization, is leading the fight on the new frontier. I am convinced that life dynamics is now the most dangerous pro-life group. Life Dynamics tactics constitute a real threat to continued access and are seriously crippling the right of women to choose and access legal and necessary abortion services. I've been with the Feminist Women's Health Centers for many years, and then with National Abortion Federation. Watching Life Dynamics makes me realize that our Achilles heel is being struck. It would be a mistake to underestimate Mark Crutcher and his team. There's something about Life Dynamics that warns you to take them seriously. These people are scary. Zentra, can you believe we are out of time? Can you believe how fast an hour goes by? I, I really can. I mean, this, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's amazing, amazing how much we had to cram right. back in here. It really is. 
Um, I tell you what, just give the folks a, a little idea about what's going to be coming up in some future shows. Okay, well, in our next month's show, we're going to be talking about how Janet Reno and Bill Clinton have turned the Justice Department into the abortion industry's private police force. This is a yeah. show that is really going to anger I'm telling you, if people don't get mad about that, they won't get mad about it, anything. It, it's just it's amazing what's going on. It truly is. We're also going to have a show on pro-life feminism. That's one that I'm really interested in doing. And we're going to have a show on circuit rider abortionists, how to find out who they are and how to stop them. Right. We're going to have a show on media bias, and that's another one that's a real hot button for <laughs> right. many people. We've got tons. Yeah, as yeah. you know, we got a whole schedule there. Yeah, we sure do. we got enough stuff here to do two years' worth of shows without even adding anything with to that, it. Without even having to go to But we do want to add to it, and that's why if okay. you have suggestions or if you have complaints or uh, what show ideas, if yeah. you if you got something you want us to do, write it in. Let us know. We, we're, we're not mind readers, so uh, send it in to us. Um, I guess right now we better tell people how they subscribe. Yeah, that would probably be a good yeah, idea. <laughs> that would be a good idea. Uh, with your video, you got an envelope like this, self-addressed. Fill it out on the back. Put your check in here, which includes the price of your, of your Life Talk subscription plus your very large donation to Life <laughs> Dynamics. Seal it up and put a stamp on it and drop it in the mail. Uh, it's pretty simple. Next month, you'll get the same thing unless you subscribe to a whole year's worth, but you'll get the same thing every month. You can decide if you want to continue or not. Um, tell your friends. They can call the 1-800 number and receive the free video, just like this one, 1-800-401-6494. Uh, uh, also, see. if you oh. want to use it during your monthly meetings, uh, yeah, monthly, we, we want um, people to do that. Pro-life meetings, uh, CPC banquets, whatever. We've had mm -hmm. people call and say, we want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, cable, cable access. Cable access. Uh, Basically, we've had a lot of calls about people who right. are interested in putting the show on cable access, right. and we are very open to that. We will give them full permission to run it, right. and we can put it on a broadcast quality tape for right. them. That's right. They don't need to use the tape that they got in right. the mail. We'll, we'll use a, one like a regular TV So they just need to use. call us. Right. Um, it looks like we're running out of time. I hear the music, so I think Richard's sending us a message. Yeah, I think so. it's time to go. Right. You did a great job, Zentro. Well, thanks, Mark. And um, listen, until next month, you remember this. Life Dynamics is not here just to put up a good fight. We're here to win because winning is how the killing stops. See you next month.